Never stop. Live with unreasonable faith. You know what God wants? He wants us to never stop living with a faith that goes beyond the limits of what is humanly possible. What did the choir just get done singing about? Power, right? And we're not just talking about any power. We're talking about great redeeming power, Holy Spirit power, resurrection power, wonder-working power, bondage-breaking power. There is power in the name of Jesus this morning. And every day of our lives. What I believe with all my heart is that God wants to use your life. God wants to use our church to be a display of that very power that we just got done singing about a few minutes ago. And so our challenge is to never stop. Live with unreasonable faith. Our church was built on unreasonable faith. One of my great takeaways from last weekend was Saturday night, and we had that question and answer, and um, I asked Brother Walker, I looked at him, and I said, you know, could you just tell us a little bit about what it was like, what you were thinking, you know, the, the week before the very first service, I mean, the faith that it took to move your young family here and to, to start a church with only six or seven people besides who was in your family. And you know, he looked right at me without a hesitation, without a single skip beat, and he said, it was no problem. It was no problem to start a church. We had no money. I had no job. He had a young family, two small kids. But he's like, God told us to come and start the church, and it was no problem to start a church. Now, how many of you would agree that's, that's unreasonable faith? That's a faith that goes beyond the limits of what is humanly possible. I guarantee you a lot of financial advisors and other people would probably say, hey, that's not that wise, but God was in it. And when God's in it and you follow him, he shows up and he does a work that can only be attributed to him. And so for year number 51 for our church, we've got to continue that legacy of faith. And so In four weeks from today, we're going to have a Vision Sunday. We've got some big, unreasonable goals that we've been praying about, that we've been seeking the Lord about, some that we're going to talk about that we'd love to see accomplished in the next year, some that maybe happen in three to five years, some that are some of those big, hairy, audacious goals that we talked about that might take 10 years to accomplish. But the point is, as a church, we need to continue to strive to push beyond the limits Because God has blessings and promises and a work and his power that he wants to display in us and through us for his honor and for his glory. And so that leads me to the title of our message for this morning, and it's simply this. Go get it. Go get it. All right, we're in Joshua chapter 18, okay? Everybody should be there. And we are, it's been a couple weeks since we've been here, but we are right in the middle of the land being distributed, okay? So Joshua chapter 13 through 21 is all about the promised land being distributed. And up to this point, five of the tribes have already received their inheritance, okay? And then you come to chapter 18, and the first three verses tell us a whole lot. I want you to look at verse one and look what it says. It says this, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. What's happening here in verse one is a huge symbolic move. The land was subdued, okay? The land had been conquered. And what happens is they are now moving the base camp from Gilgal to Shiloh. This was something that Moses said would happen back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. He's like, when they, when you get to the promised land, God is going to choose a place where he is going to dwell. And guess where Shiloh was? Shiloh was right smack dab in the center of Israel. And guess what the nation of Israel has always been about? It's been about God. And God wants to be the central focus of his children and his people's lives. And so in verse one, God is staking his claim in the promised land. He's moving his tabernacle and his manifest presence on earth, the presence that you could see on earth. He's moving it to the center of the land. And for the next 300 years, until David goes and conquers Jerusalem, this is where God would place his name, and this is where he would dwell. Now, I'm going to come back and say more about that at the end of our message. So that's a huge symbolic move. But then in verse 3, we learn something absolutely shocking. All right, let's see who's doing their math this morning. Okay, 12 tribes, right? 
Five already had their land. How many don't have their inheritance yet? Yes, there you go. Some of you got it, okay? Got it. Hey, school's coming up soon. We got to get back in the mode here. Uh, so yes, we got seven tribes that still don't have their land. Well, look at what it says here in verse three. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, everybody read that next question with me, ready? Out loud, here we go. How long are ye slack to go to possess the land? How long are ye slack to go possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? These seven tribes are not acting on the promises that God had made. For whatever reason, they're content to live in Gilgal or to live in Shiloh. And Joshua comes and he calls them out. He's like, look, this is the land that God's given you. This land has rest. I'm permanently placing myself in the center of this land. It's time for you to act. It's not time for complacency. It's not time for apathy. It's time for you to go and possess all that I have given to you. He's calling them out. He's saying, stop slacking and go get it. Go get the land. Go get the life that I have promised you and that you have been waiting for. And as we step into year number 51, I can't think of a better way to start than with this challenge, this simple challenge. Go get it. Go get the life. Go get the land. Go get all that God has in store for you to get this morning. So point number one that I want us to see today is this. Get your inheritance. What is it that we got to go get Get your inheritance. Look at verse 2. I'm just going to show it there again. I know we've already talked about this, but I just, I really want this to settle in. Verse 2. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes, which had not yet received their inheritance. That's just a big deal. I mean, they, they were happy and they were content. I mean, they were They had been living a certain way for years, 40 years in the wilderness. And then when they went into the promised land, they set up camp in Gilgal and everybody just kind of camped around the borders of where the tabernacle was. And they were comfortable and they were complacent. But but what is it that they were missing out on? What is the inheritance that we're talking about? We talked a few weeks ago about inheritance. I mean, the idea of inheritance sounds really good, right? But some of you might be in store for like a $500 inheritance, It might not motivate you to do a whole lot to go get it, but what kind of inheritance are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about a multi-million dollar inheritance? We're talking about something that you can't even put a monetary value on. We're talking about something that God wants to give that comes along with his blessings. And how in the world could we sit idly by and miss out on it? All right, here's what I want you to do. I want everybody to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33, I want, I want to show you. And we're going to look at six out of the seven tribes that had not possessed their land yet, okay? And I, I want to show you exactly what their inheritance was. It's not like it was a mystery. It's not like God kept them in the dark about what they were going to receive. In Deuteronomy 33, it's right before Moses is going to die. It's right before the children of Israel are going to cross the Jordan River and go into the promised land. And he gathers all the tribes of Israel together, and he gives one final blessing to them that had come from God. So let's start in verse 12, okay? What is the inheritance that we're talking about? Verse 12, it says, And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. To help put this in context a little bit, Benjamin is the baby of the family. Any babies of the family in here? Babies of the family, yep, there, I got my baby right here down in the front row. Babies of the family, they they tend to be spoiled a little bit, right? Maybe maybe we got some older siblings in here that are a little bit bitter towards the babies and all the extra privileges that they get or whatever the case may be. But as you go through the Bible, you find out that, that Benjamin had always been special. Benjamin always had a special care that was given to him. And here, God's treating him that same way. He's saying, Benjamin, he's saying, you're beloved of the Lord. You're going to dwell in safety. I'm going to cover you. 
all the day long, and you shall dwell between my shoulders. The picture there is one of Scarlett's favorite things that she likes to do is she likes to get on my shoulders. She, she makes me do all kinds of things before I put her to bed at night. She likes me to fly her to her bed. She likes me to carry her on her back. But normally if she gets on my back, then I become her servant, and she tells me, go here, Dad, go here, run all over, do this, do that. And I said, I'm getting old, this is, and you're getting bigger too. This is hard work. But the idea here is when you're between his shoulders, it's almost like you, you hop on God's back and, and where you want to go in your land and in the limits of the life that God's given you. God's going to carry you there. So you know what he's saying? Benjamin, stop slacking. Go get your safety. Go get the covering of God that he wants to put out on your life all along. Go get carried around by the strength and the power of Almighty God and accomplish everything that I've put you in this life to accomplish. All right, look at verses 18 and 19. Let's look at Zebulun and Issachar. It says in verse 18, And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. How many of you just like the sound of this terminology? I mean, the abundance of the sea, treasures in the sand. You know, Zebulun was going to inherit coastal lands and they were gonna come and go and they were gonna become merchants on the sea and they were gonna be able to live out of the abundance, out of the treasures that are in the sea. You know what he's telling Zebulun? Go get your land. Go get, go get the abundance of the treasures, of the limitless treasures that I wanna pour out on your life. Go get it. Go claim your land to Issachar. Go get your fertile farmland. That's where they were going to be. They were going to dwell in their tents in the land. And it was fertile farmland. And they were going to prosper. And you know what they were going to do? They were going to continually discover treasures that were hid in the sand. And guess what? There's a lot of research that has gone about the things that they've been able to mine, the diamonds, the different things that have come out of the land where God had placed them. Go get it, Issachar. You got, you got an abundant life. You've got continual treasures that are hidden in the sand to go and discover. Hey, look at Dan in verse 22. Go down to verse 22. Look at Dan. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. It's really short. That's it for Dan. You might think, man, Dan's a lion's whelp. What is that? He's a young lion. He's full of strength. He's full of vigor. And you know what? He not only was going to get his land, but he was going to leap from his land to the land next to him because he had that young, youthful, conquering spirit. And hey, my land's not going to be enough. I want more. And God, do you understand? God desires for us to have that kind of attitude when we approach him and his blessings and his will for our lives, not to be satisfied, but to desire more. Look at verse 23, Naphtali. And of Naphtali, he said, Oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. You know, the historian Josephus referred to this land as an earthly paradise. Naphtali's land was some of the greatest scenery and some of the most fertile land in all of Israel. Naphtali, go get your earthly paradise. Go get it. Why are you slack? Why are you sitting here in these tents when you have all of this out there to claim? Hey, then you could go to Asher, and we're not going to read it, but Asher is going to be blessed with children and loved by his brethren. His foot is going to be dipped in oil. Your shoes will be iron and brass. You might wonder, what is he talking about? Well, they're going to be strong. He's saying, go get your land that's going to be plentiful in olives and oil and bronze and brass, and you're going to be strong in the strength of the Lord. If you had an inheritance like that waiting, would we be sitting on the sidelines? No, go, go get your inheritance. Can I tell you this morning that God wants to bless his children? Do you understand? I believe this with all of my heart. We are not the nation of Israel, okay? We don't have a land specifically that's waiting for us. And we are not a nation in that type of a sense. But that does not negate the fact that I believe that God has a promised land for every single person here. God has an earthly paradise that's waiting for every single person here. God wants you to live in peace. God wants you to live in safety. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be successful. You are strong not in your own power and in your own strength, but in the power of the Lord. You can hop up in between 
between his shoulders and get on his back and ride through life in the power of his strength and in the power of his might. You can conquer your enemies. You can defeat the mountains and the obstacles that are lying in your path. God has a promised land for every single one of us. In that land, there is an abundance. There is a limitless supply of treasures that are hidden in the sand, that are hidden in the depths of the ocean. No matter how much we pursue, no matter how far we go, we're never going to discover all that he has in store. So why do we sit on the sidelines? Why are we apathetic? Why are we not full of faith? Why are we not in the fight? Why are we not pursuing God with every single fiber of our strength and our might? Because God has something incredible for all of us to inherit. Here's the practical application from all of this. Never stop believing. Never stop believing. Every time I hear that, I think of that song, Don't Stop. Yeah, see, I know, it's right there. I almost had Mike put the sound bite up there, but I really don't know anything else about that song, so I didn't want to do that this morning, but it's just in my mind. We've had some incredible examples of faith in the book of Joshua. Man, we talked about Caleb a couple weeks ago. We've talked about Joshua. We've talked about Rahab. We've talked about the Gibeonites. I got to tell you about another man today. His name is Zeliophahad. So I'm just going to call him Mr. Z because I don't even know if I said that name right. This man had five daughters. I could not get through the book of Joshua without talking about them. I should have had them in my last message before we went into the, because it was in chapter 17, okay? So we are gonna go back a little bit, but I, I want to show you another example of just incredible faith and how God uses that faith to pour out blessings. So back in the book of Numbers, you come across this man and he died in the wilderness and this man had five daughters, he had no sons. And so Numbers, anybody's favorite book of the Bible, the book of Numbers? Anybody just go there when you need inspiration? And it's just like Joshua 13 through 21. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. It's not the most exciting chapters in all of the Bible. But if it's your inheritance, you're going to pay attention to it, right? So you know what? Numbers, there's, there's two huge senses that are taken in the book of Numbers. The first one is of all of the tribes and all of the families and all of the people that died in the wilderness. And then the second one is... Everybody that left remaining that was going to enter into the promised land. So if your name's not called in the roll, you don't have a specific possession that's waiting for you in the promised land. So again, how many of you think if you were one of these children, you're going to pay close attention to making sure that your name is listed in the people that are going to end up in the promised land? Well, in Numbers chapter 26, there is an official legal gathering. I mean, there is an official census of all the people that are being taken. The way that it worked in the wilderness is... They built their camp around the tabernacle. God and his presence was in the center. All of the 12 tribes would camp out around that. And when there was an official gathering like this, all of the chiefs of the tribes would come to the middle. Moses and the high priest Eliezer would stand at the door of the tabernacle in front of the very presence of God. And they're going through this official listing of every tribe and every head of every family and everybody that's going to inherit in the land. Well, they're going through the tribe of Judah, and guess whose name does not get called out? Mr. Z, because he had five daughters and no sons. You know what his daughters did? His daughters said, I believe that God has an inheritance for us. These five daughters are mentioned by name three different times in the Bible. They're mentioned four different times, but by name three different times in the Bible. We don't even know Noah's wife's name, okay? So they, without anybody prompting them, without anybody asking them, without anybody calling them, they marched themselves right up to the door of the tabernacle to Moses and Eliezer, the high priest, in front of all of the men and all of the tribes. And they go up and they say, hey, Moses, we got a problem. Our dad died in the wilderness. He died because of his sin. He didn't have faith to enter the promised land. He did not die because of the rebellion of Korah, okay? Those people, I think, were, were blotted out, the ones that tried to lead a rebellion against Moses. He did not die because of that. He got his life right with God. And just because he doesn't have any sons doesn't mean that his name should be blotted out and he should not be able to inherit land in the promised land. Moses is kind of surprised. <laughs> what do you do with this? I mean... This kind of came out of nowhere. So Moses, being the wise leader that he was, he says, I'll take your case up before God. He goes to God, and God says, you know what? They are right, Moses. 
Just because he doesn't have any sons doesn't mean they should not inherit. Tell them that they can inherit their father's land, that his name will continue. The only caveat that we give you is that you have to marry within your tribe because it was important that every tribe had their own land and it was important that every family had their own land. And that was the only caveat. And the girl said, absolutely, we'll do that. And you get to Joshua chapter 17, and as you're going through the names of everybody in Judah, guess what? The daughters of Zeliophad, Mr. Z's daughters, are back And they are going to Joshua and they're saying, hey, Moses promised us an inheritance. We want our land. Do you understand this morning what we're talking about? Never stop believing. Never stop living with an unreasonable faith. Reasonable people would have talked those girls out of doing what they were doing. Reasonable people would have been too fearful to act. But people who believe that there is an inheritance and there are blessings from God are willing to take whatever risks necessary to step out of the comfort zone and to launch into what they believe God has in store for them. And guess what happened as a result? A law was changed and a family name was remembered thousands of years later. We're talking about Zeliphahad, Mr. Z, whatever you want to call him. And we learn a wonderful lesson about God and his heart. There's people in this world that want to paint him as a male chauvinist. That is the furthest thing from who God is and his heart. And there's so much that we learn when you live with unreasonable faith. Do you believe God's got something special for you? Go get it. Go get your inheritance and never stop believing and continually pursue his will for your life. Secondly, I want you to see this morning, not only do we need to go get our inheritance, but we need to get to work. We need to get to work. All right, you might be thinking, okay, now you're going downhill, Pastor Mike. I mean, I like the blessings and stuff, but we got to work for it. Look at verse 4. Go back to Deuteronomy. I mean, go back to Joshua chapter 18. Look at verse 4. He's telling them not to slack. And then he says, Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me. So here's what Joshua says Stop slacking. Pick three men from each of your tribes. Go through the rest of the land that's remaining. Draw up maps, draw out borders, draw out lines, come back, report to me who it is, and then we're going to cast lots before the Lord. And in verses 9 and 10, it tells us that they did exactly what they were told to do, and they cast lots before the Lord, and Joshua distributed the land to all of the seven tribes, exactly how the Lord lays it out. The rest of chapter 18 and 19 are talking about what their possession was and what their land was and who it was given to. So here's the point, though. That's the context right there. Get to work. There's a beautiful tension here. Is there any such thing as a beautiful tension? How many of you don't like tension? You like just peace. I like peace. I don't always like tension, but there is a beautiful tension here. The tension is this. God gave them the land, but it had to be possessed. You understand that God's gifts do not cancel our responsibility? There's too many Christians that are just sitting at home and praying and waiting for God to come part the waters, but they're not out doing anything. God's not going to just automatically part the waters in your life and open the doors of heaven unless we step up and we act. When we act and when we obey, when we do the natural, God steps up and he does the supernatural, what can only be attributed to him. You see that all over Scripture. By the way, who doesn't want a promised land? Anybody in here not want a promised land? Does the idea of an earthly paradise sound pretty amazing? Sounds amazing to me. By the way, I feel like I have an earthly piece of paradise. I really do. God has been so good. He's blessed our lives in unbelievable ways. I couldn't imagine being anywhere or doing anything different. My heart is full at who God is. But here's the question. Are you willing to work for it? Are you willing to work for what God has in store? Possessing the promised land, it would require learning new skills and engaging in hard work. I I love this thought right here. The people that went into the promised land, they were only one generation away from slavery. That's it, just one generation away. Then, on top of that, to compound the issue of growing up in slavery, I mean, you talk about generations, 400 years of slavery, They're only one generation removed, but they spent that entire generation living in the wilderness. That's where they grew up. 
And then for the past seven years, they learned some incredible new skills. They learned how to fight. They went and fought for the promised land and God delivered it. God knocked down walls. God knocked down barriers. He did incredible things and they learned some new skills about fighting and what it takes to possess a land. And man, they're starting to grow. But now they're in the promised land, right? And now they have to inherit their land. And there's a whole lot of new skills that had to be learned. For instance, they had to learn how to be merchants. They had to learn how to be sailors. They had to learn how to be farmers. They had to learn how to be businessmen. They had to learn how to be um, a lot of different things, miners and carpenters. They had to develop the skills that it would take to possess the land and develop the land and, and, and help the land to become everything that God wanted it to be. Here's the lesson. God's gifts are always given so that we can learn to serve him better. God's gifts are always given so that we can learn to serve him better. If you feel like the next step that God has for you in your life is big and scary and outside of what you are comfortable doing, then you can be confident that it's something that God is leading you to do because he does not want us to be complacent. He wants us to continually be growing and developing and learning new skills and doing the hard work that's necessary. And as we do that, and as we grow, God opens the windows of heaven and he pours out blessings on our lives. So here's a practical application. Never stop striving. Go ahead and put the picture back up there um, from just our sermon series design. I think it's next there. Okay, so... You can see that on here. I, I, love, I, just, I like the idea of this picture. I think it describes the Christian life in a lot of great ways. You might notice that there's a wall that's been broken down. For the children of Israel, they entered the promised land. The land was subdued. How many of you would agree that was a pretty major barrier that was standing in the way? This morning, we just baptized people. How about being dead and lost in your sins? Is that a big barrier to all that God wants to do in your life, absolutely. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you become a new creation in Christ. Those walls, what held you in bondage, it's broken down. And guess what? You now step into a brand new world. You understand? I, I like that idea. Like when we're looking ahead and when we're thinking about the future and you're thinking about the life that God has for you, think about the beauty, think about all the possibilities, think about the limitless things that are there for you to explore. Never stop striving. You wanna see a little bit of the end of the story? Look at uh, Joshua chapter 19. Remember I was talking about Dan a little bit earlier. Um, <laughs> I love Dan. Look at verse 19, verse 47. Remember he was like a young lion that would leap? Well, look what's said about him in verse 47. And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. God didn't give him enough. He said, it's too little. So look what he did. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and called Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their father. Hey, once Dan got their act together and once they went and got their land, they started, uh, started living up to everything that God intended for them to be. And they saw more and they wanted more and they chased after it and God gave it to them. In the next few verses, you're going to find out that the very last person to get his land is Joshua. And you know what Joshua did at the very end of his life? He built a city. Now, I, 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 I've been thinking about that phrase a lot this week. He built a city. I mean, at the end of his life, he could have just went up and been like, this was no joke. I had to live in the wilderness for 40 years. We conquered the promised land. I'm tired. Just give me a house somewhere, some trees, a rocking porch, and a fishing pole, and I'm good. No, you know what Joshua did? He built a city. He never stopped striving. He set his family and the next generation up for success. And by the way, that's where satisfaction and fulfillment is found. Can I tell you, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the prayer of Jabez. God, bless me. God, enlarge my coast. God, enable me. Listen, that is the prayer that we need to pray. Yes, there's work to do. There's a tension. But God, bless me. I want everything that you want to pour out on my life. I want you to enlarge my coast. I want you to take what you've given to me, and I want you to use it to show the, other wor the rest of the world who you are. Give me more influence. Give me more reach. Enable me to do it. Protect me. That's the attitude that we need to take into life. All right, I got a question for you. What new skills are you learning or perfecting? What new skills are you learning or perfecting? We got, 
we can't just sit and listen, okay? We've got to make this as practical as possible. How are you growing? What, what, what new skills are you learning or perfecting? I was thinking back to um, early on in the ministry. I was I just, this question God gave me last night, I've just been pondering it and thinking about the work of the ministry, thinking about how we've grown through the years. And I was remembering the early days working for Brother Stewart and a lot of times uh, we, would have to, we would go make visits. We'd spend a lot of time visiting older people in their homes, just different things like that. And this one particular day, I was going to visit this older couple, and before I went, they knew I was coming. Before I went, I got a phone call, and they said, can you go by the store and pick me up something? And that something happened to be an enema, a laxative, okay? (laughs) Yes, okay, this is where we're going. So I'm sitting there, like I'm remembering this, and I'm like, I didn't even know what that was. So I think, I, I don't know if I called Atlanta, I asked Jenny, I was like, they want me to get an enema, what is that? And they just kind of laughed and chuckled, and I'm like, okay, wow, okay. So then I go to Kmart, and I'm looking all around, trying not to ask for help. This is when Kmart's still over here, and I couldn't find it, so I had to say, I need an enema. <laughs> then I go up, and I make the purchase, and the purchase was only an enema, and the guy's like, I hey, hope you have a better day, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, this is how this story's going along. Then I get in the car and I got to drive to this family's house and then panic comes over me and I was like, dear God, if I've ever done anything right in my life, I've tried to live for you and serve you. But I started thinking, I was like, okay, he's not in good shape and she's in a wheelchair and they're not going to ask me to help him with this, are they, Lord? <laughs> and I was like, please, dear God, if there's anything I've ever done, I just need your mercy and grace in this hour. I surrendered it to the Lord. I was like, I am your servant. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. God, I'll do it, even though I don't want to. And we just went there, and I just kind of tossed him the bag. I didn't mention it, neither did they. Praise God. He answered that prayer. You may be sitting there wondering, what in the world does this have to do with anything? And I was just thinking about (laughs) lessons that I've learned through the way and how God's developed and how God hopes you to come into the person that you need to be and now you have to surrender certain things. But you know what I learned about all of those days and all of those visits, how important it is just to be there for people, to listen to people, to be there in their joy, to be there in their pain, to be present in their sickness, to love on people, to be willing to serve people, to be able, willing to do even the most mundane things that you would never think would ever happen in your life. It doesn't matter what it is. But you know what ministry is all about? You know what possessing the inheritance is all about? Not just what's in it for us, but how we can take what's been given to us and use it to bless others. So how are we developing our skills? How are we learning? How are we growing in our service for others? How are we taking the resources and the talents and the abilities that God's given to us, and how are we furthering them for his advancement? Another just quick illustration, our our kids a couple weeks ago, uh, several of them had a chance to go on a mission trip. One of their favorite days, I know my boys, one of their favorite days was they went to um, this place, I think it was called Renew, and they met a businessman that was an engineer, and they helped pack 150 backpacks. And guess what these backpacks do? These backpacks are made with technology. You take them to closed countries. They're satellite, I mean, um, not satellite, they're uh, solar powered. And they turn into these pop-up screens that play the Jesus film. And the 150 backpacks that they put together are going to be used to reach 2.4 million people for the gospel. Here is this businessman with unbelievable potential and unbelievable wisdom and knowledge. And you know what he's doing? He's taking his skills and he's using them to further the kingdom of God. That's what it's all about. Get to work. Never stop striving. And the last thing is this. Get your rest. Get your rest. Look at chapter 19, verse 51. How many? Now that sounds good again, okay? Get your inheritance, get to work, but get your rest. Look at verse 51. These are the inheritances which Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divide it for an inheritance by lot, okay? So this is it. All 12 tribes are now divided up. But look what it says next. They divide it for inheritance by lot in where? Shiloh. Before the Lord, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, so they met an end of dividing the country. Chapter 18, 
opens the section with Shiloh. Chapter 19 closes this section with Shiloh. It was God who gave them the land. This was something that Moses predicted and talked about back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. He said, when you get in the land, God's going to choose a place where he's going to dwell. And this section is out of Shiloh, out of where God dwells. He's challenging his people to get to work, to go after the land that I've given you. At the end of it, it comes back to God in his presence, where he's reminding the people that I have given it to you. This is coming from God. And you know what the lesson is here? Where God would dwell, the central place in the land, Shiloh. You know what Shiloh was? Shiloh was a place where God's Shekinah glory would be, his visible, manifest presence. You could go there and the presence of God was there. God dwelt on earth. God dwelt among his people. And in Shiloh, according to Deuteronomy 12, they would bring their sacrifices. They would bring their burnt offerings. They would bring their tithes. They would bring uh, their, their, their promises that they would make to God, their vows that they would make before God. And why? Because if God was the central focus, there would always be rest. If God is the central focus, there would always be rest. You have to understand everything about the nation of Israel was built around God and who he was. Every Sabbath day, once every week, there would be a day of rest. Their calendar was built upon holy holidays. God always wanted to be the central focus. He never wanted to be far from our minds at all. He wanted to be first and foremost, front and center. Because why? When we look at God, we're reminded it's God who gave them the land. It's God who defeated their enemies. It was God who promised to protect them. It was God who said, I will bless you. It was God who wanted to use them to show this world who he was. If God's the central focus of our life, you know what there's going to be? There's going to be rest. I want to show you Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 12. Look what it says, because this is where he lays it all out. He lays out what Shiloh would look like. He tells them to bring their offerings and their tithes and their sacrifices. And then in verse 12, he says, and ye shall, what's that next word? Everybody say that out loud. And ye shall... Before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you. Here's the practical application. When you get your rest, never stop rejoicing. Never stop rejoicing. Do you understand what Shiloh was supposed to be all about? Man, as they brought their worship and as they brought their sacrifices and as they brought their offerings and as they brought their vows before God, they were living out of the abundance of their inheritance, right? They were living in the land that God gave them. They were digging up the hidden and deep treasures and there was a limitless supply. And as they focused their attention back to God, they would come back and they would be rejoicing and they would say, God, You've blessed me with so much. Here's this. Here's that. Here's these promises. Here's these vows. I never want to get far from you. I want to give you more. I want more of what you have to offer me because you've blessed me and you've been so good. And did you notice in that verse, it wasn't just enough for you and yours. It's enough for the entire circle of people that God's placed in your life. The way that God wants to bless you. Everybody, your neighbors, your coworkers, your lost family members, the distant relatives, everybody in your sphere and circle of influence should see it and know it and you know what we must do as we chase after God and as we never stop believing and as we never stop striving we never stop rejoicing because our God is a good God has God been good in your life are you blessed this morning I know you may be faced with all kinds of struggles and trials, but can I tell you, every single person in here is blessed far beyond what we deserve. And can I tell you this morning that we have it? We have it even better than the children of Israel had. In just a second, we're going to take out these elements and we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. In this cup is a piece of bread and then there's some juice The bread represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us on the cross. The blood, the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for us on the cross. 
Can I tell you that the children of Israel had to go offer their sacrifices to God continually year after year after year for thousands of years? The sacrifice would have to be made on the cross. And you know what Jesus did for us? He laid down his life and he paid that sacrifice once and for all. And no longer do we have to go through a priest. No longer do we have any barriers. We have direct access to the holy of holies. We can step into the very presence of God any time of day, any time of night. And guess what? God wants to bless us with all the spiritual blessings of heaven. Ephesians chapter one, go read it. You'll be encouraged. He wants to show us the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. We have even better than the children of Israel have because we have a risen Savior who is alive. Guess where the manifest presence of God is today? Inside of us. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of you. He wants that wonder-working power to be on full display because he wants the world to see who he is through your life. This morning, in just a minute, when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, It ought to motivate us. How can we not go get the life that God has for us when he's done so much 